The way we lead impacts the way people live. This world needs truly human leadership. In terms of um, philosophy on serving customers, I, I think it's fairly simple. Always do the right thing. Now, what does that mean? Because it, that can mean different things to different people. But I think if you, you know, always do the right thing for our people, you always do the right thing for our customers, and you always do the right thing from our, for our company, in the end, you will win the, the respect and trust of those customers. I'm Brent Stewart, your host. Thanks for listening. This podcast is an outreach of Barry Waymiller. You can connect with us on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, and Twitter at Barry Waymiller. And find our podcasts, articles, and videos at trulyhumanleadership.com. Before his retirement earlier this year, after 32 years with Barry Waymiller, Tim Sullivan was group president, paper, and converting. Over his time with our organization, Tim served as CFO, VP of Customer Service, and president of various companies. And Tim still serves on our board of directors, but before his retirement from day-to-day -day activities, he sat down with me and Mary Redder for a wide-ranging conversation about his leadership journey, Barry Waymiller's evolution over the years, and a lot more. Tim was a shaping force around many of our philosophies about customer service, so he talks a lot about how we try to earn and nurture our customers' trust. He also talks about Barry Waymiller's response to the 2008-2009 economic downturn and how that was a turning point for many leaders in our company in terms of fully adopting and embracing truly human leadership. And we start off this conversation with Tim by him giving his definition of truly human leadership. You know, if I had to put it in very simple words, I would say respect each person and value each person. I mean, that's really the power of truly human leadership, is being able to value each and every individual. Again, how does that come through in, in the way we do business at Barry Waymler? I think it's the way, uh, the way we empower people and the way that they feel empowered and the way they make a difference uh, in our company, you know, from rapid response teams to, you know, um, customer service representatives, engineers, field service technicians. I mean, all of these people, and I'm only naming a few, uh, have tremendous responsibilities and tremendous opportunities to impact our customers and our business. And if you can truly respect and value each person, uh, you know, I think it, it just loosens great energy and great power on behalf of our company. How in the world did you end up at Barry Waymiller? Uh, well, I had a good friend uh, who I started at Anheuser-Busch with right out of college here in St. Louis named Phil Ostapovich. And uh, Phil and I, uh, you know, spent the first four years of our career together at Anheuser-Busch, first here in St. Louis, and then we both uh, transferred together to the Los Angeles Brewery, which is how I got to the West Coast. And Phil had moved back previously. Uh, he had taken another job uh, with Coca-Cola, moved back to St. Louis, left Coke St. Louis and joined Bob here at Barry Waymiller. And he began talking to me about Barry Waymiller and coming back to St. Louis. Um, he was my introduction to Bob. And of course, you know, serendipity, right? Things, things come together. About the time I was, I was talking to Bob, I was uh, also courting my wife. And uh, we were both Midwesterners. We were looking to move away from California and back to the Midwest. And I was really looking for an opportunity to join a smaller company with aspirations to grow and just see where it leads. And Bob made a great impression on me, and the opportunity at Barry Waymler seemed to be seemed to match a lot of my talents and a lot of my uh, experiences. So it just seemed like a good fit, and we took a shot. Did you at that point think, I'm going to really help this company grow, I can really help it grow? Or were you like, I need to learn some things? I mean, what you know, everybody, you, when you come into a job, you sort of have a plan for what you can, how you can add value. So. Well, 
I, I came into the organization as the acquisitions guy. So I reported jointly to Bob and to our CFO at the time. And I really was here to uh, help the company do acquisitions. So yes, I was really hopeful that my particular talent would help the company grow. I would say within my first week here at Barry Waymiller, uh, we began discussing the acquisition of pneumatic scale. So I joined, I, I came here in March of 1989, literally 32 years ago, and we acquired pneumatic scale in Boston in mid-November of 1989. So it was like the, the first thing I began working on when I came here. And it, you know, our, our CFO was a very tenacious guy. Bob, of course, uh, is a very tenacious person. And uh, they made it happen. But there were a lot of other acquisitions after that pretty quickly, right? I mean, that was sort of the big one that kicked things off and did. What did what, what you learn from pneumatic scale? Because that, that's one we talk about all the time and, you know, sort of the la launching of it all. Well, for me personally, it, it, uh, it really demonstrated kind of the attributes of the type of company we were looking for. You know, until you actually engage in an acquisition and in you know engage with a with an acquired company and uh, follow the the strategy. I mean, how do you really know the the strategy works in action? So I think what Pneumatic Scale demonstrated for me was that the strategy that had been put together in terms of the types of companies that we were looking for and the the types of companies that or are the type of strategies that we would uh, undertake and tactics we would undertake all came home with pneumatic scale. And what were those tactics? Because Barry Waymiller wasn't well known and, um, you know, we didn't have the cultural selling points that we do now. So why did they want to join Barry Waymiller? Uh, well, they didn't. I mean, initially, I mean, that's, that's sort of the challenge of of our industry is that you know we're in a an industry that's uh highly fragmented several industries now that are highly fragmented that have a a lot of private companies family owned and in many cases those companies really don't want to sell they would prefer to to remain independent and keep the company in family ownership but generally they hit some sort of an event that causes uh, financial distress and forces them to to look outside for a partner. And Pneumatic Scale was a was exactly that case. It was a, a hundred year old company that had a a great history, an enormous installed base of equipment due to that strong history. But they were suffering from poor leadership at the time. Had lost their way a little bit. Were in uh, significant financial trouble. And uh, that allowed us the opportunity to really uh, come in and uh, partner with the leadership team, buy the company, partner with the leadership team, and begin to, to turn the company around. And, you know, those are the, I mean, the philosophies we were looking, you know, the, I'd say the traits we were looking for in potential acquisitions were exactly that. A company with a great history, a large installed base of equipment, and then uh, some sort of, you know, financial distress because, you know, Bob was very confident that he knew how to fix those companies and turn them around. Most of our early acquisitions followed that formula exactly. Well, we've talked a lot through the years about the hidden value that we were able to see. Um, did you see that? Did you feel that? Uh, I did because I immediately, at Pneumatic Scale, began working uh, with Bob and with the customer service team at Pneumatic Scale. So, you know, I, I, that was my indoctrination, you know, deep into that philosophy. Um, and, and yes, I could see the value emerging as we began working uh, on the aftermarket side of the business at Pneumatic Scale. Right, that's where you became VP of customer service. So, um, and a lot of, you know, I mean, your customer service uh, acumen is still 
you know, talked about today. So what do you, what would you, how would you characterize your philosophy on serving customers that you've, you know, sort of probably ev uh, sort of developed back then? In terms of um, philosophy on serving customers, I, I think it's fairly simple. Always do the right thing. Now, what does that mean? Because it, that can mean different things to different people. But I think if you, you know, always do the right thing for our people, you always do the right thing for our customers, and you always do the right thing from our, for our company, in the end, you will win the, the respect and trust of those customers. And, you know, doing the right thing for a customer isn't always exactly what the customer thinks they want. You know, in a lot of cases, they want, uh, you know, some sort of a discount. They want some sort of, uh, uh, you know, free service. They want whatever it happens to be extended warranties, a lot of different things that, you know, they want value at the moment. And in my mind, always doing the right thing for a customer means helping them find the value over the long term, the value in the partnership with our company, the value of, you know, the assets they acquired over the long term. So, you know, I would, I would say the philosophy is always do the right thing. You know, I, I, I don't want to take too much credit for this. A lot of the things that we put in place at Pneumatic Scale were just extensions of Bob's experiences and philosophies. You know, number one, customer service people touch our customers generally on a daily basis. I mean, we always had the philosophy that, you know, you could sell a machine to a customer, but, you know, customers only buy machines when they need to expand production, uh, they're launching a new product. I mean, that can be a frequent thing. You know, customers buy, might buy machines annually. They might buy a machine once every five years, once every 15 years. But when they're operating those machines, they have touch points with our company through our customer service representatives on a daily or weekly basis. So, you know, making sure that our customer service representatives are valued and motivated is, is fundamental to who we are as a company. And then customers have a right to expect outstanding service from us because they trusted us. They bought the machine. They have a, a right to expect that we'll stand behind that machine. And that means delivering parts, you know, at better than industry norms. Customers have a right to expect if they call us, they're going to get a part uh, on a very timely basis. So, you know, we worked with our customer service reps, uh, to make sure they felt empowered and felt the, you know, the ability and the support to serve our customers in, in an outstanding fashion. We worked with the manufacturing side of the business to make sure that we were fulfilling parts orders on an extremely timely basis through stocking programs, through uh, rapid response teams, through a, a number of initiatives. And were these things that you had learned in your MBA program, or did you feel like you were, like, learning on the job as you went? Oh, it was all learning on the job. I mean, that was one of the, the great things about Barry Wambler in the early days is, uh, you know, you could try things and and keep trying things. And if they didn't work, you you could stop and try other things. I mean, it was a, it was a great place to, you know, to learn and grow. I mean, there was a lot of, a lot of freedom and, no, I didn't come with any particular skill sets in customer service, trust me. All right, so then you then you were elevated to president of Pneumatic Scale. Um, so that oh, was your... No, before that, I had to stop in finance again. Okay. I went from VP of customer service to CFO. So is this sort of like, hey, okay, Tim, I want you to do this now, or...? The, just the short story on becoming CFO is Bob decided one day that he needed a new chief financial officer, and he would tell you at that time he didn't have very good luck hiring people from the outside. So I guess I was, uh, you know, everybody else took a step back, and I didn't move. So I was I was the one left standing there. So Bob Bob talked me into moving into uh, the finance role. Wow, how'd that go? Uh <laughs> We've had better chief financial officers, I'll tell you that. My, you know, and that was my first reaction uh, when Bob said, hey, I have a thought. Uh, that's always 
you know, I've learned since then, whenever Bob starts, hey, I have a thought, that's when you you cringe and take a step back. But, um, I mean, seriously, he, he one day said, hey, I have a thought. Um, you know, I really need to move on from our current chief financial officer, and I'd really like you to step into the role. My first reaction was, Bob, you know, I am not an accountant, and I am not, not somebody that uh, aspires to or would be good at being, you know, the head of finance in a company. And uh, he felt differently, and he we had a long talk, and uh, eventually, you know, I thought about it overnight, and I came back to him, and I said, okay, you know, I want to try it. Uh, and I would say I was in the role for two to three years, from 1995 until 1997, I think, a little over two years. And I really was just the leader of the finance department. I wasn't necessarily the senior finance person, if you will. Uh, so we had good people in finance at the time, uh, Greg Coonrod, Mike Zaccarello, uh, and several others, and we made it work. We made it work. But it clearly was not a great long-term fit for me. Well, because they also needed you then to take over the presidency of New Mexico scale. And so what is this? what were you learning about leadership at that point? Because, you know, Bob is – basically placing his trust in you he saw something in you and said okay i gotta tim's got some skills here he's doing a great job what he can figure things out and he can motivate teams and individuals you know i i guess what i learned or the way i approached it was be confident but be humble um you know people needed to have confidence in you as a leader so you needed to be confident that you could you know, undertake this responsibility and, and uh, this care for people. But you needed to be humble and recognize that, um, you know, I didn't know everything I needed to know to, to uh, be the CFO, and I didn't certainly didn't know everything I needed to know to be president of a company. But there's a lot of skilled people, a lot of talented people throughout the organization, um, and you just got to be humble and you got to, make sure that you you find those people and you listen to their input um, and as you said Mary uh, you just you learn as you go well it sounds like some of the central things that served you well too was I realizing that our customer service people need to be appreciated for the critical role that they play so that was one thing because we needed our customers, but we needed our customers to feel needed and 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 valued, and uh, that their needs were being met. And you were learning a lot about leadership. You know, we talk a lot about that sort of that ripple effect. If we take care of our people, you know, your customers will be taken care of. I mean, do you think that is? And how do you know that? How do we know? that our customers are feeling the way that we treat our people well. When you say, how do you, how do you know that customers feel our culture? I guess what I'd say is, uh, you know, customers choose us. They choose us as partners, whether it's buying a new machine or, you know, they choose us as their partner because they trust us. They trust our people, and they trust that our people are empowered to help them be successful. And, you know, the clearest example I have, I mean, we've, we've certainly won our share of orders that uh, we weren't the lowest priced competitor. We weren't uh, necessarily the, you know, had the, we didn't necessarily have the, uh, the leading edge technology. But uh, customers choose us. And a, a great example, let's just say a, a big tissue customer uh, who was expanding a mill in South Carolina was working with our team in Green Bay to choose a supplier. And this was a, a contract that was worth tens of millions of dollars. And we weren't the incumbent supplier. The incumbent supplier was a competitor out of Italy. And we didn't necessarily have leading edge technology. We had very competitive technology, very competitive with uh, the incumbent in, in Italy. But our people made our customers, decision makers, feel so comfortable when they visited Green Bay and so comfortable that they would be taken care of and valued as customers 
no matter what happened, you know, through the installation and the operation of these machines, even to the point where uh, one of the one of the decision makers uh, had some eyesight issues, and our team went out and blew up and expanded all of the drawings to sizes that this gentleman could read. And, you know, frankly, he was so touched by that, that our team was so thoughtful uh, to do something like that, that, you know, that was probably one of the key moments that pushed the decision in our direction. So, you know, our, our team members are truly empowered. They are people who think uh, beyond themselves and think about our customers. And I think that shines through. The key is to making sure that our people feel that. I mean, truthfully, and, and obviously there's, I mean, we have recognition events and, you know, those sorts of things. But I think, I think you just have to be a genuine leader and a genuine person on a daily basis. I mean, I, I, that's the, you know, in my world, that's the, the greatest thing that you can do is just be a, just be a genuine person and a genuine leader on a daily basis. And I think people, people feel that. That's just what I've tried to do. It's a little bit of who I am. And, uh, you know, I think people, people respond to that. You know, one of the things that as listening to you talk, the history of our company always fascinates me and it always fascinates me that it's was kind of this continual evolution, you know, continual evolution in terms of the business and continual evolution in terms of our leadership. And so when Bob started having these thoughts about leadership uh, and started kind of introducing these concepts within the company, how did people react to that? Like, how did you and how did other people of the leadership react to these thoughts that Bob would kind of almost randomly have and then present to everyone? I don't, I don't know. I mean, none of us were, were shocked or taken aback or thrown off our game. I mean, clearly Bob's uh, philosophies were evolving uh, to where he felt very strongly about, about people and you know, it wasn't just about numbers anymore. And I would say, you know, initially, probably like anything, uh, you know, you just you just keep doing your job and uh, wait to make sure it's not the flavor of the day in terms of a new philosophy or strategy. Uh, it was clear early on that this wasn't going to go away. But I mean, look, a lot of our leaders cared about people. We just didn't uh, enunciate it. I'm not sure that I made any major adjustments in my style or anything. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's not revolutionary. You know, a lot, of, a lot of these things are just common sense. For you guys in the leadership, it probably didn't really become really game-changing or obvious until the downturn in 2008, 2009. Yeah, I think that's fair. I think, I think uh, you know... Until 2000, 2008, 2009, probably none of us were really sure what it meant. Mm -hmm. And that was really the test for all of us in terms of how Bob would act, how, how we would all react to that downturn. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think you're right. I think that was probably what kind of cemented the, the culture for all of us, quite frankly. Yeah. Uh, when Bob brought up the idea of the furloughs, did people think, well, I don't know, it sounds kind of crazy, or did people really latch on that and think, you know what, this re this really could work, we really could, this really could be the way we could do this? Oh, I, I definitely think it was the latter. I think I think everybody everybody wanted to find a way through that crisis without impacting impacting as few people as possible. And so when the ideas, the idea of furloughs was introduced, it was, I think everybody embraced it. Everybody wanted to contribute something. And, you know, it was a little bit of the shared pain concept. I mean, everybody wanted to contribute something. Nobody wanted to see the person next to them 
uh, let go or laid off because everybody had mortgage payments, everybody had children in school, everybody had medical bills, etc. So, you know, sharing pain broadly and everybody taking a little, I think everybody felt pretty good about that. PCMC it specifically really had this kind of family feel to it. I assume that this kind of this kind of idea of weathering this crisis had to resonate two people with that sort of bond together. Well, no, no question about it. The other thing that is unique about PCMC is it is one of the few places that we have a union and we have, you know, we have significant membership in the, in the union in PCMC. And of course we couldn't like changing benefits. We, we did not have unilateral authority to change benefits because benefits are something that you agree to contractually with a union. So when, uh, you know, our leadership team sat down with the leaders of the union and PCMC and said, look, you know, we have this concept of, of furloughs and, you know, we're also suspending the 401k match for a period of time. Um, and we'd like to ask you to participate and help the company. Uh, the union leadership stepped up and they said, look, you need two to four weeks from all of our members. So, you know, that you're looking for X number of weeks. I, you know, we had roughly 200 union members at the time. So, you know, we were looking for somewhere between 400 and 800 weeks of furlough. And they said, look, let us, let us, we'll get you the four, the four to 800 weeks, but we might have some people who want to take more and some people who want to take less, but we'll get you the four to 800 weeks and they also agreed to suspend the 401k match, which which they didn't have to do. Yeah. So that was uh, that was a great validation of their belief in Bob and his mm-hmm. philosophies. Um, a great validation of the local leadership team in Green Bay and the trust that they placed in them. Um, and of course, you know, we all know how the story worked out. It worked out extremely well. So, you know, I, I think that just from what we were saying before that that might have been kind of an aha moment in a lot of leaders in our company's career and maybe even yours are there any other kind of big moments that you were kind of aha moments for you that would make you maybe made you think or act differently or maybe make you think about leadership or business differently yeah uh, yeah, that was clearly an aha moment, I think, for me and probably for a lot of people in terms of just the impact that our culture can have and how it can benefit our organization. Other aha moments. Going back to something we talked about a while ago, when uh, Bob asked me to become CFO of the company, and I didn't see that in myself. I didn't see that I had the skill sets or the leadership to really make that leap. But Bob was so convincing uh, that I, I took the risk and took the opportunity. That was kind of an aha moment for me that, uh, you know, Bob probably had more confidence in me uh, than I even had myself for that particular role. Mm. And um, I would say that it, it caused me to maybe look at some of the people I work with a little bit differently in mm. terms of not just accepting them for who they are or how they see themselves, but really in terms of what their potential is. And, you know, I mean, after that, I had to talk Bill Morgan into taking the role as president of Pneumatic Scale. And later on, I had to talk Steve Kemp into taking the role of president of PCMC. In both (laughs) cases, their initial reaction to me was exactly the same as my reaction to Bob. (laughs) And, you know, obviously, uh, Bill Morgan and Steve Kemp, you know, have both done outstanding jobs in their role as president. So... So that was an aha moment for me, what Bob taught me in terms of, uh, you know, seeing seeing something in somebody that they don't necessarily see in themselves. In your career, what are some of the things that you're most proud? 
frankly, just being part of a leadership team uh, that took opportunities like pneumatic scale in the early days or Marquip or PCMC uh, and help those businesses that were failing um, and help those businesses survive and thrive and uh, help to give people some security and a future. I mean, you can talk a lot about other accomplishments, but uh, you know, to me, that's that's probably the thing that I'm most proud of is just being part of a team that helped give people some security in a future. You know, every time I think about PCMC, I think about the story of Ken Coppins that's in, in the book about him collecting cans around Lambeau Field. And I think about how PCMC changed so much. And that's a great point that you make that these companies that we came in and acquired and were able to turn around like people were they were going through real hardships and then we were able to to help you know stable well, they, they, they had no security right yeah. they they didn't know when the next layoff might come about and how long it might last mm -hmm. so it you know it's hard to be you know it's hard to hard to feel safe and it's hard to feel good about yourself when you're in that situation yeah. So just the fact that, you know, we have been able to provide some stability to those companies and, you know, provide jobs that people can count on. Yeah. And incomes that people can count on. And I think that's the thing that sometimes people often miss with Barry Waymiller in terms of talking about what we teach about leadership and what we say about leadership is that people kind of latch on to the, um, to the treating people well part of it, which clearly is, is a huge part of it. But the business piece of it really means a lot too. And it's, and it's very equal. And it goes back to this, this uh, providing stable um, lives for our people. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's so important. I mean, we all know how important it is in our own lives. So um, yeah. Do you have any predictions of, of how, our business or any businesses are going to change or going to look um, now that we've gone through this huge pandemic in the last year. Any thoughts about that? I mean, certainly we've all learned a lot, right? Uh, I mean, we're using tools like this right now. I think it was Plato who said necessity is the mother of all invention. I mean, as this pandemic hit, people around the world had to find new ways to conduct you know, their personal lives and new ways to conduct business. And a lot of our businesses were very creative and, uh, you know, either created new tools to interface with customers and interface with each other or accelerated the use of certain tools. So, you know, and I expect that a lot of this isn't going to go away, certainly not completely, and may even become a, a I wouldn't say preferred method of communication because in my mind, nothing will ever replace interpersonal face-to-face -face communication. There's always going to be a need for a certain level of that. But I think it will impact the way we do business. You know, we've done much complicated machine checkouts remotely, mm -hmm. uh, which, you know, allow our customers to not have to travel great distances, sometimes even across oceans to check out machines. So I, I think it will give people more freedom in terms of freeing them up from time-consuming time, time consuming and tiring travel uh, to be able to devote more time and resources to uh, things that you know they can do productively and the things that they enjoy doing and, and hopefully have a higher quality of life and a you know, greater sense of balance in their life. When you look back on your own leadership journey, what do you see? Were you flexible? Were you humble? Did you care about others? Did you look at customers in terms of other people that need to be cared for, that deserve care, as opposed to another dollar sign or another quota to fill? Thanks for listening to our podcast this week. Don't forget to find us and connect on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, and Twitter at Barry Waymiller. And you'll find more podcasts, articles, and videos at trulyhumanleadership.com. I'm Brent Stewart. Thanks for listening.